Hello and welcome again to Conscious TV. I'm Ian McNay and my guest today is Art Tickner. Hi Art. Hi Ian. And Art has written a book called Solid Ground of Being and a lot of the interview will be based around this book. And it, it's, uh, it's a very interesting book. It's not necessarily something you read and you get gripped and you can't wait to turn the next page. It's a book of contemplations and meditations and some poems, but it does very much reflect art's journey, I think. And we will look at art's journey now. So, when you were in your childhood, you weren't too happy, were you? No, I, I probably, in, I see that more in retrospect than I did at the time, yeah. But my earliest memories were always sort of feeling I'd taken a wrong turn somewhere and gotten into an environment that wasn't too friendly. And how, how, and how was that for you? Well, uh, the way I could maybe put it in perspective is as life has gone on, it's gotten progressively easier for me. And some people, when I talk to them, they say, oh, oh, it's just the opposite with me. But for me, I, was, I never felt quite like I was at home. Mm. And uh, I grew up in a small town in New York State in the USA. Had, uh, I knew everybody in town. I liked people. I uh, always waved to people, you know, knew, knew all the folks in town. I can remember, though, as a kid, I trusted, I felt I could trust older people and not kids my own age. Mm. And now that's almost the op opposite way around. Now I have, have more trust in kids. There were, I think kids are more naive, maybe, you know, and, and more straightforward. As, as we get older, we get more sophisticated and cover up our feelings and things like that. So you got married about 18 years old? Yes. Mm -hmm. And studied a conventional life, went to college, and you were, mm -hmm. was it computer science as you were studying it? Well, they, they didn't really have much in the way of computer science, so I, I got married at 18. I, I found out my, I probably shouldn't say this, but I found out my girlfriend was pregnant, and I was delighted because I'd already gone to college, flunked out of the first year of college. Um, I didn't know why I was there, and so when I found that I, I, I had a direction now, I think I was happier about it than my girlfriend was. And so when, when our first child was born, when we were both 19, after he was maybe three months old, something is like a switch flipped in my head. And I, one day when I was looking at him, I thought, my God, here is somebody I would like to see ahead of myself in the trough for life's goodies. I think those were the exact words. I think mm -hmm. they're indelibly inscribed on my mind. And uh, it, it, the flip side of that coin was I saw that I had been the most selfish person in the world before that. And I, I don't think I could have seen that without the contrast. Mm. So I think that was actually the first time I fell in love. So was, that really opened up something in you? I suppose it did. Yeah, I, I, don't, I didn't see any great changes after that in terms of the way I acted or whatever. Mm. But I think, I think uh, the mind opens, or you could say the heart opens at various points in your life. And uh, what, what you're able to experience at that time depends almost on what you may know about yourself. Mm. And so falling in love is like a death experience in some ways. The ego was momentarily out of the spotlight. It was a huge relief, you know. And then over time, mm -hmm. you got a qualification from university. Right. I majored in math. Math. That was right. the one subject I had to study in high yeah. school. I breezed through high school. I think the teachers just liked me, maybe. I don't know. And uh, when I got to college, I had no study habits, and I majored in math. But I, I think what I liked about it, the same way with Mozart, there seemed to be, it, it was logical. And I have a logical type mentality, and there was an answer. You can work yes. the problems, get an answer, and you can see very uh, beautiful ways to get there in a sophisticated but simple way. I think that's what I liked about it. Yeah, and you, you were saying in some notes I found on the internet that basically you were, had what you wanted in life at that level. You had a beautiful marriage, you had a child, a family, yes, yes. you had a job which was a decent job, you mm -hmm. had a nice house and everything, yeah. and yet something was gnawing inside you, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, it, it, it would come, it come and go, so it wasn't every day that I was consciously aware of, but seemingly, I don't know what the periodicity was, but you know, over a period of 10 years, say, it would come and go once or twice a year, and I would, 
I, I thought of those as identity crises, and I think in retrospect that was exactly what they were, but I, would know, I had no idea why I thought of them that way. So what form did that take at the time, having an identity crisis? Well, uh, I, as you say, I felt I had everything that should have made me happy, and uh, I, I would try to scan the horizon to see if I did this, if I acquired this, if I went back and got another degree, and, and uh, all those things I'd done enough so that I could mentally fast forward and realize that won't do it, that won't do it, but I had no idea, so I was at sea, I had no idea what was missing, but I, I felt like it was a missing purpose or meaning. Mm. So you started to explore a little in reading some Zen. Mm -hmm. Very, very simple stuff. It was Alan mm. Watts, who was probably the first American who uh, started talking about Zen, so that it became popular over there. So I'd read some Alan Watts, and uh, there was something about Zen that sounded appealing. I had no idea what it was. I thought it was black robes, sitting with your legs, your knee, your feet under your knees, and watching candles burn, and uh, that that was my idea of Zen. And then there was at one point where you went to the library, it was raining one afternoon, yes. and your wife saw a flyer yes. for a Zen discussion group. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was at the local university, Ohio State University. And um, I thought, well, I'll go check this out. And the funny thing is, it took an entire year before I got to the first meeting of this little group. And when, when I did, I found people, maybe a dozen people sitting in a circle talking, talking. And, I thought, they don't have a clue what Zen is about, so you know what I thought Zen was. But after I listened for five or ten minutes, I thought, they're talking about things I've never heard anybody talk about before. It's immensely interesting to me. Mm. Yeah. So that was a relief in one way, I guess, was it? It, it was, and I'm not sure how much of that. Uh, my wife and my uh, family were all I felt I needed for years. I didn't try to make friends other than people I worked with, you know, but casual. But, yeah. but no deep friends, nobody to really talk to about things like that. Yes. And I think that was a big component, is just finding people who had a common interest and you could talk easily with them about it. Mm. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting thing with uh, the whole concept of what friendship has become, isn't it, in the yeah. world? And it is about people that you have common interests with, maybe sports or hobbies or mm -hmm. just neighbors or whatever, and you have a conversation. And yet, for some people, there is this yearning to have a conversation at a more deep level mm -hmm. and that somehow it isn't always appropriate in those people right. that you know. So it is isolated, it can be isolated. Very much so. Yeah, for years and years, and I, I didn't see this until one time later, uh, I had the feeling that I'd better wait for somebody else to make a gesture of friendship and I didn't want to be the first one to hold my hand out and yeah. get, get a rejection. Mm. And so I imagine that's very common that most of us are like that to some extent. So this group that you went mm -hmm. to is a TAT group, is that well, right? Uh, it, it wasn't uh, named as such. The, the name they had for it was uh, Pyramid Zen. Pyramid, Pyramid Zen. Zen. Okay. And this was back in the era where pyramids had a lot of connotations, you know, like the pyramids you sit under to ripen the vegetables and all that kind of thing. Okay. But uh, this was based on um, the, the, the group had been started by some students at the university after Richard Rose, a man from West Virginia who I later became very uh, friendly with, you know, uh, after he'd given a public talk there at the university. And uh, his, his idea, the, the way he used the term pyramid, is he would talk about, oh, uh, distributions over a, lo a large number of people. So the, like uh, wealth, for example, there was a pyramid of wealth where most of us would be down near the bottom and then gradually, you know, the pyramid gets uh, steeper and steeper at the top. Yes. And he was also talking about that in terms of a pyramid of spiritual levels and spiritual work. So, so was there a political side to his work as well? No, not at no. all. No. Uh, he, he was, he, he, <laughs> one of the funny things was to watch the news with him. He'd watch the news on TV with the sound off much of the time and comment about the psychology of the newscasters, the people in the news <laughs> and things like that. It was a, a huge learning experience. <laughs> so he was doing it through ob ob observation. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. So tell me a little more about Richard Rose. I hadn't okay. actually heard about him he's, he's not very well known, obviously, yes. is he? Yeah. Not in the UK, no. No, no, not in the US either, really. No. So what's his background? Well, uh, he grew up during the Depression. He, he was from a family with four children. His father was a plumber. And uh, they, they had a lot of trouble during the Depression. And 
uh, at one point, a couple of the kids were in an orphanage, you know, in order to try to feed the family. The, the family sold property in town, bought a farm out in the country to try to grow some vegetables and things like that. And uh, Richard was a, a fellow who had been very religious as a little child and also psychic. So, and that was something I'd never been around before. I, I thought that was all baloney. But uh, as a child, uh, he, he was, for example, I remember he said one time when he had gone to, ch his mother would go to Mass every morning. She was Catholic. And uh, he, he said uh, one, one morning when he went to Mass with his mother, he saw the priest and he said, he's going to die. And his mother said, she don't talk about things like that. And apparently within a week or two later, the fellow had died. Mm. And so... Uh, but when he was about 12 years old, the, still during the Depression, he went into a preliminary seminary. I forget what, exactly what, like a junior seminary or something like that, um, 50 miles or 100 miles away from where they lived. And he thought that was wonderful. He said, I'm going to, these people, the nuns and the brothers there will be talking directly to God. And so he, he as a little child, he wanted to get talking directly to God, mm. very re religious. And he said it didn't take long to get disappointed. He found out they weren't, <laughs> weren't talk, they didn't have a direct line to God. And he was in and out of that uh, preliminary seminary until age 17, two or three times he was back and forth. He said eventually he spent most of the time up, it was one of those huge old mansion type places. And he said, I spent time up in the attic reading the books that you weren't supposed to read. So that's how he found out about the Albigensian Crusade, for example. Yes. And the, the, first book he wrote and the one, the only one that was published when I knew him, when I first met him, was, he called it the Albigen system. And he didn't mention Albigen anywhere in the book. He mm. hoped that people would, out of curiosity, they'd do a little research for themselves and find, but, but he respected them because of their, the courage of their convictions. So what practical work did you do in this group you were in? Well, that, that's a good, that's a good question because uh, Richard Rose didn't feel there was any like cookbook approach that if you do this now and then you get to a certain point and then you do this. So it was basically um, going within. So the, the thing, when I met him for the first time, if this gets too long, tell me about this, but when I met him for the first time, I didn't have a particularly good, I'd read his book and I, the, I had two impressions. One is that he had the best sense of humor of any, and I was a reader nonstop from the time I was a kid. I thought he had the best sense of humor that I've ever come across, and, and also that he felt he knew everything. And I was firmly convinced, having a logical type mind, that you couldn't know anything for sure. So when I first met him, about maybe two or three months after I'd started going to the meetings at Ohio State, uh, when, I, when he came up unannounced from West Virginia where he lived to one of the meetings, and when I saw him, when I came in, I figured this must be Richard Rose. So I went to introduce myself, and I said, my name is Art Tickner, and I'm in this for a selfish reason. Why are you doing it? I, I wasn't trying to be intentionally rude, but it was, obviously. But uh, I'd heard he went around the country to give public talks without charging anything for them. He let people stay on his farm. He asked that they'd share the light, the electricity bill, you know, if they were burning the lights. But he, he seemed, I, I felt he had to have an ulterior motive. And so... He, he, just, he, he just very calmly looked at me and he said, well, first of all, what you're doing isn't selfish. And he said, I guess the reason I do what I'm doing is because it's an, an addiction. I can't help myself. And when he said that, it just knocked the block off my shoulder. I, I just had a feeling he's, he's down to earth. He's, you know, he's, in the, he's real. He's not trying to pull any scams or anything. But why did you feel that what you were doing was selfish? Well, uh, and uh, I think everybody I've ever talked to probably it generally feels it is. You know, you realize, well, I'm not diverting this energy toward my family, toward getting ahead and everything. It's me, you know, focus on me, which is uh, egotistical, right? So seeming like that, I could see that it was selfish in that mm. respect. I I'd, uh, had the kind of personality that if, if my wife was smiling and my kids were smiling, I was happy. I was an idolater. And so I could see this was diverting my attention from that. You see, um, I wrote something down here that, about Richard Rose's uh, techniques, and it says Rose considered confrontation yes. as one of the cornerstones of spiritual work, basically as a group discussion in which members look for inconsistencies, rationalizations, and blind beliefs in one another. It easily devolves into ego-based debate and defense without a school moderator 
It's a piece about you here. Yes. Art's presence is a great aid in confrontation as he has the wisdom of years and the wisdom of an egoless perspective, allowing him to more easily recognize the ego's defenses. Yeah. So tell us more about that and what you okay. learned, because this, is, this for me is interesting stuff. Yes. Yeah, and in fact, now Rose, uh, I, I don't recall him ever sitting down and having a confrontation session with people or one-on-one. -on -one. He wasn't confrontational. He, he, didn't, he didn't try to, the, the thing that amazed me the first few years I knew him is I never felt he was trying to push on my mind. So he was very patient in that way. He would suggest things, but sort of he, he'd talk in a broad perspective. He wouldn't say, now, Ian, you should do this, or, you know. Okay. And, but the two, the two uh, practices he recommended, but this was for people to work with each other, not with him on. One was confrontation. And so every city I lived in after I met him, I tried to find a few people to, to have a confrontation group on a regular basis with. And some well, I was successful so in. What does that mean, a confrontation okay. group? Yeah. So, uh, for example, I've, I've been doing one in Pittsburgh, close to where I live, for 14 years, I think. And basically what I do is uh, we'll, we only have a couple hours at the library where we meet, and then we go out for coffee afterwards. But for that couple hours, I try to structure the time so it doesn't become just chat and uh, try to give every person a chance to talk about what's on their mind or uh, lots of times there'll be a question or a little excerpt from Ramana Maharshi or somebody and uh, ask them for their uh, reactions to that. And then after the person runs out of steam talking, then the other folks, we fire questions at them. And if we do it well, they're, they're questions based on our curiosity to understand the other person, not trying to sell our view of course, we're human, right. you know, so we don't always do that. But basically trying to help. So it's, it's a self-inquiry form of practice. And the idea with doing it in a group is for accidents to happen, like with group therapy, although it's not aimed at that. And then for the person to have more ammunition when, when they go back to do their meditation practice, uh, new, new angles to do inquiry. So it's basically all asking yourself, who or what am I? But the mind gets bored with that real fast. So that, that's so the purpose. So people coming from different angles to help yes. the person look or confront at their reality of what they really are. Yes. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. No, and that it's sounds an, good. It's an intentional uh, use of tension, which is very uncomfortable for us. Yeah. So uh, new folks coming in, they'll typically try to, if somebody, they'll try to fix the person's problem they're talking about. Yeah. Or they'll say, oh, it's OK. You'll be OK. You know. All of which, and, or they'll talk and take the focus off the person who's on the hot seat, so to speak. Yeah. So it's an intentional use of tension for hopefully productive means. And how is it being in the hot seat? Uncomfortable. Although yeah. for me, I was more comfortable talking than sitting quietly. That just, that really freaked me out. So, yeah. For, yeah. Uh -huh. But I guess, I, guess, I guess there is an art, and that's why it mentions in this piece here about you being a very good moderator here. It doesn't get into a personal thing yeah. with people putting their own unclarities on the other person. Yeah, yeah. I obviously have more perspective for doing that now than I did 10 years ago or 20 yeah. years ago. So I'm sure it devolved into just psychological nonsense yeah. in the earlier years. Okay, so you were, were going to this, this group. Mm -hmm. um, and how did you feel you changed during that time? Oh, uh, two things that occurred to me. One is... Uh, after I had gone to a few meetings, I remember one of the meetings, one of the weekly meetings I went to at the university, the moderator of the group there had asked a question. I don't know if it was either of me or of everyone. What were you thinking about on the way to the meeting? And my response in the meeting was, I wasn't thinking about anything. It was springtime. The leaves were coming out on the trees, and I've always loved that, that the springtime things. And uh, so I said, I wasn't thinking about anything. But when I walked out of the door that evening, I was stopped in my tracks. I realized, my God, I'm watching my thoughts. I didn't know that was even possible. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I was very, very fortunate over the years. It took me a long time to get to the point where you'd say, uh, puts the mind at ease. But uh, I had many little satori, I call them satori, that's not a proper use of the word, but yeah. many little insight experiences like that that were motivators to continue on. So when you say they were motivators to continue on, there was obviously a green light there. And did they, would did they take away to some extent this underlying feeling that you had? 
beforehand? Mm, only one that I can think of offhand, and that was uh, probably 10 or 15 years later. I, I think of it as a, an acceptance experience. And uh, I, I could go into more detail if you're interested, but basically what happened is my, I, I was doing a solitary retreat, and uh, my, it felt like my mind went into a hyperdrive, something I wouldn't know where to press the button to make that happen. It was doing a lot of thinking about, I'd, I'd made a list, I'd, I have to keep backing up to remind myself, I had uh, taken a book by uh, Hubert Benoit, the French psychiatrist, that I had read years before, but didn't, I knew there was something there, but it didn't, I didn't know what it was. That had been sitting on the shelf collecting dust for years, and for some reason I just picked that book off the bookshelf before I went into the solitary retreat, and I'd, I'd read the first chapter or something, and he had a description of, uh, no, it wasn't the, his neurosis description, I, I forget now what it was, but for some reason the first thing I did in the retreat was I made a list of, I, I'd call them pain balloons. Uh, there, there were painful memories I had, maybe half a dozen, that I seemed to carry around with me for years and years, where somebody had said something that offended me, or you know, some like an embarrassment. Hmm. I made a list of those, and yeah. So Benoit said, uh, in terms of acceptance, that's what it was. His definition of acceptance was if you look at something from your total being and ask yourself, would I change it if I had the power to do it? He said acceptance would be answering yes to that question. And I really, my mind argued with that. I thought, oh my God, that would be putting all this stuff in concrete, you know, all, all these painful memories and things, or worse yet, in lucite where people could see them, you know. And uh, so in the solitary retreat, I just, I started making, I didn't have any plans. This was all just happening. So interesting for me to watch. I made a list of maybe four or five of these pain balloons, and my mind took the first one and started going like, like a, a download on a computer, you know. And uh, after a while, the answer popped out, I, if I chose to change that, I might have made things far worse than they actually were. Mm. And so that answered it for that. I, the, my mind started doing the same with the second on the list, and for a completely different path through all that data, but came to the same conclusion. And that's all it took to convince the mind mm. that, uh, and what happened is I felt myself going up, although I knew I was still sitting in the chair where I was sitting, but, uh, the, and I, I got a, like a snapshot. And, and I don't have a pictorial type of imagination, so I, I don't know the right words to use, but let, let's just say, you know, like uh, a new view, and then my mind scrambled to find words for that new view. And the words that came to me from up here, everything down there is perfect just as it was and is. And interesting. at that yeah. time, it was a huge weight lifted off yeah. my shoulders. Yeah. yeah. Everything yeah. down there is perfect. Perfect, the way. Just, just as it was yeah. and, and as it is. I know that retreats have been very, silent retreats have been very important to you. Very much so, so yes. Tell me more about this in okay. terms of how you would structure the retreats mm -hmm. and what you felt you got out of the retreats. Okay. Yeah, I started uh, doing these. This, this was one of the things that Richard Rose promoted, and I was open to trying anything he promoted. And so when I first met him, I had started a new job not long before that, and I just had two weeks of vacation per year. So selfish, I took uh, a week in the spring and a week in the fall to do go off in the woods. He had, a, on his farm, he had some cabins and old trailers and things like that where you could get away and not be disturbed. So. I spent a week in a, in a trailer that had no heat. It was in the late fall. It was cold. It was rainy. It was miserable. And I, I decided not to eat for the week. I'd never tried fasting before, but I didn't want to be bothered with food. So being the, the research type mentality I have, I read some books on fasting and how you prepare for fasting and went through a, that whole rich, ritual of eliminating things over a period of time. And uh, well, a shocking thing was that I went for a whole week without eating and never felt what I thought was hunger. So what I thought was hunger was like enter, entertain me time, mm. yeah. And on that, I think it was that first one or it could have been the second one. Uh, yeah, I think it was because it was rainy and cold and one day the rain stopped, the sun came out and I thought, oh boy, I can go out and get warmed up and dried off. I went for a walk on a country road and as I was coming back, I saw there was a stream running by the side of the road and a big boulder in the sun. I thought, oh, I'm gonna go out there and sit in the sun and really get warmed up. And then I saw a no trespassing sign. 
This was in West Virginia. I was living in Ohio, you know, a sophisticated state, not really, but in West Virginia, I thought, oh, this is hillbillies. And I thought, there's probably some hillbilly behind a tree <laughs> waiting to pull a gun if I step on his property. I, so this was another time when I was rooted in the road. I couldn't have moved because what, what happened is I started seeing the decision-making process in very slow motion. Mm. So I was just uh, enthralled, I guess you could say, watching this argument of idiots in my head, the fears and the desires, you know, oh, I want to do this, no, but if you do, it's like a uh, different one runs across the stage with a, with a sign, you know, that to represent what it wants and doesn't want. And uh, so what's happening in your retreats is that you're spending time looking at what your mind is doing mm -hmm. and what reality is and how that reality changes. Mm -hmm. Is that right? I think that's, that's very accurate, yes. And I, I mentioned before about the going within um, suggestion or direction. When I first met Rose, uh, he, he rang a bell that I didn't know was in me. And mm -hmm. uh, the words that formed in my mind were, this fellow is telling the truth. I've never heard it before, but something in me recognizes it. And then a couple of days later, I was thinking, what was it? That, what was the important message? And it took a, a long time for it to get through to my conscious mind. And that was, the answers are within. Mm -hmm. And so that was basically what I was trying to do, was to go within. But obviously, everything we look at is out here, isn't it? Even though it gets closer in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but so going within is what I was trying to do. I didn't know what that was or how to do it. And Rose didn't say, oh, if you want to go within, you take two steps to the right. So he, he basically was trying, he says, whatever's necessary. You do whatever's mm. necessary. Mm. And if I, had, uh, if I had more character, that's what I'd tell people. But I, I try to be more helpful. <laughs> 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 but I, actually, there's very little that a person, so everything that I say is based on my own experience, and it's all opinion. So if, if somebody says, well, what's it like when you know yourself? All I can do is uh, I'm, I'm basically using an instrument that can't tell the truth mm. about what that is, and so I, I find myself, especially like in the, with the folks in the Pittsburgh group, is in the coffee shop, they'll get me talking about something or other, and I think afterwards I've been fooled again, I should keep my mouth shut. <laughs> <laughs> because anything I say can be misleading. You know, I, yeah, I, I understand completely. Mm -hmm. So you actually had a period of six or seven years with quite deep depression, didn't you? Yes, yes. How, how was that? <laughs> yeah, I, I was living in uh, Miami at the time, and I had gone to the farm to do a solitary retreat. By this time, I was doing uh, month-long solitary retreats when I when I could. Lots of times that meant I, I would lose whatever job I was working on, and, but I didn't care. That was really my direction. And uh, I, I apparently, usually I would try to talk to Richard Rose for half an hour or so after I finished a solitary retreat, but I must have had to catch a plane or something. I didn't see him. Maybe he was out of town or something. So I wrote him a long letter, uh, every thought I had basically during the retreats, you know, too, way too much detail. And I didn't hear back from him. And I figured, oh, uh, it must have gotten lost in the mail. So this was back in word processor days, and I had a copy, a digital copy, so I printed another letter out sent it off to him, and when I didn't hear back from him, I thought, he's lost hope in me. So if he's lost hope in me, it's hopeless. Yeah, so that's what kicked it off. I saw very clearly what kicked it off. Did you really believe that? Oh my God, yeah. Yeah, there's no doubt. Mm -hmm. And for me, I'm a professional doubter, so whenever yeah. intuition hit me, it was dangerous. Okay. Yeah, because like, like the uh, light bulb that went on in my head, the, the first solitary retreat, uh, I thought that only happened in cartoons. That was the first, maybe the second time I'm conscious of intuition really hitting me directly. And mm. uh, So that's actually quite dangerous that you, yeah. your teacher you think <laughs> has loved hope in you and then you don't necessarily, uh, haven't yet found the ground sufficiently yourself yeah. to hold that. Yeah, and the funny thing is I, I had a feeling if I asked him if that was intentional, he wouldn't necessarily have told me the truth because if he was trying to produce a shock, mm. Then, so I was stuck in my own corner. I, I didn't have any way to confirm or uh, disprove my belief. Yeah. Because uh, Rose, Rose was, uh, one, one of the things that he talked about was the mind needs shocks. And you, life presents them, you know, it's not like you have to make them artificially. But, so sometimes a person who's, who has a, a larger perspective can produce a little artificial shock that could be helpful. Mm. So, yeah. 
And how did you handle that six or seven years? <laughs> I, I got a lot of mileage out of it. I, I, th <laughs> I think I indulged in self-pity for seven years. <laughs> yeah, in retrospect, it could have it easily uh, taken care of itself in a month. But I, and, and since then, a, a lot of the younger people, particularly, I run into, uh, they're, they're overeducated and depressed. And it seems to me now that depression is, it's like going to the health spa. You've been knocked down. You're not ready to get up yet, so it's like a rest period. Mm. And I don't have any argument with that, but I wouldn't advise anybody to take seven years before they get up. Okay. But it was the, the acceptance experience I had at the end of that seven years which got me up, basically. And just tell me briefly about that, about that experience. That, that was the one I was mentioning before about having read the Benoit definition of acceptance. Okay. okay. Yeah. So that, that happened on a solitary retreat, and that, that ended that. Uh, another, another thing, during that time, my mother, my father had died quite a few years before that. She had been living by herself for four years after he died, wasn't taking good care of herself. She was in New York State. I finally got her to move down to Miami with me, and uh, she was at a point where she needed uh, help, but she uh, could pretty much take care of herself. But so that, that whole period, I felt like I had to check on her every day. And uh, it, just before that, the, and I hadn't done any solitary retreats for that period. And so she ended up having to go into a nursing home, and that sort of freed my schedule or my conscience, I guess you could say. And so that was the first solitary retreat I'd done in seven years also. And, and that's when that happened. You also had uh, a near-death experience where you also drowned, where you almost drowned, didn't yes. you, in the Pacific Ocean, mm -hmm. which was quite a strong experience for Yes, you. yeah. Yeah, and, and uh, looking back over, over that and an early experience that happened when I was maybe 10 years old, which was also a surrender type experience, I, I have the feeling, although this is speculation, that uh, when, when you have, when, either when you fall in love or when you surrender to death, uh, the mind opens up, the, the part of the mind that I would call the intuitive mind or the, the heart, you know, opens up. And, and at that point is when you get new views, yeah, big, big possibly big views. So with the drowning experience, I, I'd never even heard of a riptide before. The first time I swam in the Pacific Ocean and I got caught in a riptide and I started flailing as much as I could. I didn't want to end up in Hawaii, you know. So <laughs> I, I started flailing as much as I could with my arms and legs and finally they just got to the point like spaghetti, the muscles wouldn't work anymore. Mm. And I realized this is it. I, and I shocked myself, even at the time I was surprised, I'm, I'm not, it's okay, you know, it's it. This is it and it's, it's okay. The, the, the terror had left at that point when mm -hmm. I admitted there's nothing more I can do. And uh, I started getting a life review, which you, you hear about that with yeah. sailors too, don't yeah. you? So it may have something to do with that kind of a situation. And it felt as if I were seeing my life, I was coming up the trunk of a tree from earlier experiences to more recent experiences. And I had the strong conviction, although I didn't test it out, that I could go down any branch on the tree as I passed by and see any as much detail as I wanted to see about any, like my whole life had been laid out on that plane hmm. that, up to that point. And uh, as I was getting back closer and closer to that time, the, I, I, I'd lost body consciousness. So all, all my mind was aware of was just this film or whatever you call it, you know, this picture of the life review. And then the next thing I felt with my body was my knees scraping on the sand. Hmm. And I was a long way up the beach. I don't. Uh, I, I think I used to say a quarter of a mile, but that's probably way too long. But I found myself a long way up the beach from where I'd been struggling. I'd just been carried sideways, I guess. So it's a mystery in a way how you got to that point. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't conscious of what was happening. But you were alive and you were breathing. I was. I hadn't swallowed water, apparently. Wow. Isn't that strange? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. And then a very significant thing was when you discovered um, Douglas Harding. Yes. Yes, definitely. And there's this book, which um, little book of life and death, mm -hmm. which you connected with. Yes. Tell me about your first meeting with Douglas. How that was? <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I had signed up. He at that time he was still making two visit or a visit each year to the U.S. on the West Coast one year, on the East Coast the next year, and I had signed up. Some friends of mine in Raleigh had uh, scheduled him to come to Raleigh and do a workshop. And so I had signed up for that, and that was in the fall of whatever year that was, and uh, early, early around 2000, I would guess. And uh, that summer, when he he had he used to do summer retreats every year, not retreats, but work, summer workshops every year. And uh, he had fallen down some stairs there, and, and uh, his doctor said no more long plane rides. 
so he, he didn't come to the rally. And, and uh, so I, I still wanted to meet him because several of my friends had been in his workshops and, and uh, good friends of mine said, you really need to check this fellow out. And I didn't have the patience. I didn't want to go through a workshop. So I just emailed and said, could I come over and visit you? And uh, he and his wife graciously invited me to come over. They didn't know, know anything about me. And uh, the, uh, an important point that I've found, and this is uh, just my bias also, but I think a, a real teacher will be available. That was the case with Rose. It was the case with Harding. Um, Harding was much better known than Rose, so he would have had even more reason not to. Uh, so you're saying when you're available, a real teacher becomes available to help teach you? Maybe, yeah. Well, I, I don't even know about the first part of it, but I think okay. a real teacher is available to, what, I guess what they would pick up is somebody who's either a serious seeker or in trouble in some way, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. So there are no, no lieutenants to go through, you know, no big organization. And that, that's another reason why uh, there, there are people like Eckhart Tolle, who wrote a wonderful book, The Power of Now. I think the rest of them haven't even matched up to the first one, which may be a indication to me that I ought to stop too, although I'm working on a couple more. But uh, w when you have a bit, when you draw a big crowd, I don't see how you'd be able to spend time individually with people. Mm. And, and to me, that, that's what's important. And, and I'm so thankful that Richard Rose and Douglas Harding were willing to do that with their students. So, so what did you get from being with Douglas Harding? Well, the, the way I had been working for 25 years was what I'd call a paradigm. I was looking for the self, and the paradigm I was working with is the dividing line between inside and outside. The self is inside. It's what, what we don't see yet, and anything that is in the view outside is not the self. So that was basically Richard Rose's paradigm, and I'd been, right. work, I'd been looking at things through that paradigm for 25 years. And when I met Douglas Harding, he basically, for me anyway, I don't know if other people would see this for themselves, but uh, he, his paradigm was flipped just the other way, that anything in the view, you are, anything in the view is within. So before anything out here in the view was outside, mm -hmm. now it's within. Yeah. And my mind uh, would flip back and forth like a Necker cube when you watch the cubes, the, the lines where the cube flips in and out as you look at it. It was like that. My mind would flip back and forth between those two paradigms, and it could not pick out one that seemed truer. They both seemed equally valid. Mm -hmm. And that's a condition the mind does not like. Yeah, so to me, it provided exactly what I needed to set up an opposition for the mind to chew on, you could say, or try to, try to resolve. Because mm. he had these kind of masks, didn't he, which you war, yes. and you didn't see your face at all. Yes. Uh -huh. You just saw the outside. Well, uh, the way he would use them is a tube where two people would put their faces at opposite ends of the tube. Okay. And then he had a series of questions. His, his, uh, his experiments were somewhat based on suggestion. And he told me when we were talking one time, I, sp I met him twice for just a few days each time, he told me he wasn't above using hypnosis to counter hypnosis. I think he was a very astute student of the mind, but also he didn't like anything about psychological self-inquiry. So that was a huge difference also. Richard Rose thought uh, self-inquiry included that as a beginning level to sort of be able to get out of your own way. Right. And Harding thought that was a complete waste of time, that all you had to do was look directly within. But the, the experiments are basically what do you see when you look within? Isn't it, you know, a wide open space? Isn't mm. it looking out of one window, not two eyes? And all those things, I was suggestible enough that they made perfect sense to me. The idea about the feet being up, not down, perfect sense. I could see when, when the mind flips to that way of looking at things, it's, it's right that mm. way. I should just mention to viewers that we do have a program about Douglas Harding's work. Um, on Conscious TV by Richard Lang, who's one of his students. So if you are interested in following this in more detail, you can find that program. Richard does a wonderful job with the workshops. Yeah. He does indeed, mm -hmm. yeah. I'm not sure I personally still quite get it. There you go. <laughs> Probably more practice. You may not be sufficiently suggestible. <laughs> so you had a very significant retreat where 
again you went away to a hermitage cabin mm -hmm. in a Benedictine monastery. Yes. And something, you had a little fast for two or three days mm -hmm. to start with, yeah. and something really seemed to change. Just talk us through okay. those six days, how long it was. Yeah, um, the, the, when, when I'm fasting, the two or three days that I did, the, I didn't have too long, I think it was just a week or eight days, something like that. So I, I fasted for two or three days. And when I'm fasting, it, I'm usually too uncomfortable. To, it doesn't seem like a productive time in terms of self-inquiry, but it definitely shocks my mind, which is the value I see of it. And uh, so it gets me out of my comfort zone. And uh, the, after that, I spent about three days going through, in, in the book that you mentioned, Harding's little book of life and death, I think it was in the prologue, it might be the introduction, there was a series that he called Test for Immortality. I may have the exact wording wrong, but that's basically what it was. And I, I visited Harding in February of that year, that was 2004, and when, when I got home, or maybe on the flight home, I don't recall exactly when, I, I felt a mood descend, descend on me. And the mood was, I want to be more serious, I want to become more serious than I'd ever been in my life before. And uh, th this is the mind, procrastination. I, I could have become more serious right at that point, but no, I was convinced that I'd never be able to do anything unless I was away from people, you know, in solitary type isolation. And uh, I had an isolation scheduled for May of that year, and I kept my mental fingers crossed that that mood of seriousness would last, which it did, fortunately. And so the, the thing that was so different about that particular solitary retreat was I had to see things for myself. I had to be able to differentiate. When I looked within, I had to be able to differentiate between what I had accepted by agreement from Richard Rose, from Ramana Maharshi, from Douglas Harding, from folks like that, versus what I really saw for myself. It had to be yours. I, I had to take the responsibility, you could say. To, mm. I think when, when different teachers uh, talk about becoming your own authority, yes. that's when it happened for me. Yes. And uh, when, I, when I got through those three days, uh, that was close to the end of my retreat. I might have had another day later, uh, but the, the night, the final night of my retreat, I remember thinking, well, it's been a wonderful week again. I don't regret it by any means, but um, I haven't found what I'm looking for. And so I'd saved going, I was, this was on Lake, or just across the road from Lake Erie where this monastery was. And I'd saved going down to the lake to see the sunset over the water until the last night. So I went for a walk. When I got back to the cabin, the hermitage cabin I was staying in, I sat in the chair in the living room. And I thought, my God, this is the first time I've ever sat in a chair and not done something. So <laughs> where, where does that come from? I couldn't have intentionally sat there not doing anything. My mind always had to have something to be working on, a backup plan in case that didn't work out. So I, I sat there thinking, I was, I was astounded. And uh, during those last three days, there, there was like an open sesame phrase from Harding that would come to my mind, uh, what am I looking out from, question. And whenever that happened, my, my mind, so I didn't need to do the finger pointing experiment anymore, but I was looking back in the direction that you look out from. And uh, dur during that final uh, sitting, what, what happened is uh, it felt as if uh, and Richard Rose said the same thing. I don't recall asking Harding about it, but he says there's help. And, and I knew that things were lined up that there was no way I could have lined them up. And mm -hmm. it felt as if something were holding my inner head, looking back at what I was looking out from. And, when, when it, uh, and, and so what I was seeing was awareness. I think before that point, we're not, we, we have a feeling that, that that's awareness back there, what we're looking out from, obviously. But uh, you don't really see, I didn't see it. So it was just a, an agreement. And something, when, when I was uh, focused, where I, I couldn't have if I'd wanted to, I don't think, turn my attention away from looking back here. Eventually, I saw that I was looking at awareness, and I saw that awareness was self-aware. When that happened, my mind said, wait a second. Uh, I'm a separate awareness here that's looking at awareness. There's a lie here somewhere, either a lie that awareness is self-aware or a lie that I'm an individual awareness. And so that's basically what broke the spell, the hypnosis with the mind for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You described it in um, some notes that I have here that 
on the sixth day of retreat, I was sitting, not doing anything, looking back at what was looking out from awareness. And here's the quote, I'm observing it. Art Tickner was never alive. Yeah. Something broke the identification with the observer. There was no regret in seeing the sense of the separate self go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, that surprised me too because yeah. Richard Rose, when he had his breakthrough, he was 30 years old. It was traumatic for him. The, the, so to me, there's the, the breakthrough you can't, what, when you know yourself, it's a knowing that's outside of the mind's knowing. But you can talk about the transition leading up to it, the transition coming back from it. And his was very traumatic in both directions. And so all of his students felt, well, if it ever happened to us, they'd be carrying us off in stretchers. But yes. In my case, I think it, the, the ego, you could say the, the identification with a less than true, less than complete idea about what, what you are, that, that had been eroded enough over time so that the final, uh, the final thread that broke, it wasn't traumatic. It was just, uh, it was very, you know, plain, you know, yeah, Art Tickner, that, in other words, what I believe myself to be, that, that had never and I, I wouldn't use exactly the same words. I would, I would say that is what existed. The, this existere stands outside of what we really are. Yes. So what, what I would say now is uh, what I believe myself to be. But that, I think those were actually notes that I wrote afterwards. Yes, I, I took them from some notes that were yeah. on the website. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So it was uh, just a, oh, yeah, so what? You know, it wasn't a big deal to me when I saw that Art Tickner never existed. So yeah. if I'm to ask you now, who are you? Yeah. What's your response to that? But, um, in order to try to convey something of it, the best I can do right now is to say that for Ian, for anyone who goes within and finds what they are at the source, it's what I am. In other words, it's not different. It's what, what mm. we are is the same. When you talk about oneness, that's misleading because one implies many. So there's, there's, you can't, in language, it's hard, about the closest you can get is some paradox. You know, it, it's uh, infinite, but it's not big or, you know. It, it, there, there, are no, there are no, it's like our personality. To me, there are, there are two primary steps that we, when we retreat from untruth, the first is, identification with a personality. And to me, personality I implies uh, things hanging off of, of, of something. So it's like characteristics. So my personality is, oh, I'm average height. And my personality is I wear this, you know, I've got 10 fingers and whatever. It's, it's the characteristics that someone would identify Art Tickner by. Yes. And once, once we realize those are just in the view, they aren't really what I am. I could live without ten fingers, you know. Uh, the, the, the hard one that the mind can't uh, back itself off from is individuality. Yes, yeah, I'm interested in, do you feel your personality changed since this time? Yes and no. So uh, most of my neighbors, I don't think, would recognize any differences. Even my close friends, they wouldn't see uh, huge differences, although I may not be quite as argumentative as I used to be. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, huge, the huge changes, and I didn't realize this until a year afterwards, but uh, Buddha had written something about uh, the, the ridge pole being broken. And, and I realized that expressed exactly what my feeling had been when I came, to, to use a phrase that would uh, probably get me in the nut house, came back into the mind, uh, was, is such a huge relief because there's no, what when you know what you are there's no vulnerability and and you know you're not what was born and what's going to die you know what you are uh it has no form it couldn't change if it wanted to you know it doesn't want to so all the form and everything is a projection of what we are into a split world where you, you could say the purpose is just to see itself it, it 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 doesn't see itself directly it knows what it is and it's there's where we are at the core of our being, there's never been a problem. You know, all the problems are in the mind dimension. And so it just, it settles the mind. So you are the solid ground of yes, being. Yes, yes, as are you, as is. It's interesting the way you use the words no vulnerability, because yeah. 
people do talk about being incredibly vulnerable and open, but yeah. you're saying there's a stage beyond that, which is, it is the solid ground of being. Yes, yeah. And it's the only solid ground, I'm firmly convinced, mm. that we, we, can, we can become more comfortable, but in order to really put the mind at ease, we have to know, the mind has to know what its source is. Does it come and go? No. No. I understand it's always there, like yeah. it always has been yeah. there. We always hear it's always there, always has been right. there. But for you, are you, it's almost like the words don't quite fit now, but I have to use the I words. know, it's, it's, it's yeah. a communication problem, yes. isn't it? Yeah. And but for you, mm -hmm. there is never a time where there's any doubt. You're always coming from this place of solid the, ground. The mind resolved that question of doubt. Uh, the, the I remember one of my first reactions, and it may have been in the notes that, that you read also, was, I can see now why Richard Rose thought he might have gone insane. So hmm. when, when your focus comes back into the mind, this, what you know is, do, it can't be computed by the mind. And so I, I assume that anybody who has had that breakthrough, when they come back into their mind, their mind doubts it, and it should. And what, what uh, distinguishes it eventually is the mind admits that it's a form of knowing that it isn't capable of. And so currently that's, that's always there, but it, uh, dementia could erase that. Yeah, mm -hmm. so uh, nothing, nothing stays still in this dimension. Stillness is death, you know. So the, there's always movement. The mind is a, a moving problem solver. Yeah, so uh, the brain is certainly subject to disease, and, and so I, I wouldn't be surprised if someday I'll, I'll get to the point in dementia where I, this mind won't know, but I don't know if that's the case is or not. Is there an evolutionary aspect to the ground of being, or is the ground of being just the ground of being? Yeah, the, gr the ground of being certainly doesn't evolve. Um, it's hard telling about humanity, whether there's some evolutionary, like color-sidedness or something like that, whether there, there seems to be a, a lot of people talking about um, self-realization and cosmic consciousness and things like that. And whether it was as frequent in the past or not, I have no feeling for, but I, I'm sure that uh, what we are at the core of our being doesn't need our help evolving. <laughs> that it, it's running the show. And it, it, there must be a big orga, uh, engineering organization somewhere between there, and I didn't see the engineers, but you know, when you look at the absolute complexity of the body of the cosmos, you know, it's a, there has to be a big engineering organization somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have to stop in a minute. Um, what I'd like to do is, once we've stopped the program, just to do another very brief discussion with you about a paper you wrote on meditation. Okay. I was hoping to include that in the main program. It used to be five minutes or something. Okay. So, but I'm going to just finish this, this program by just reading something which you wrote, which I really like, which is it's called Finding the Real Self is Looking Until What's Looking is Known. Mm -hmm. I should get you to read it. Oh, I'd have to find my glasses. Oh, I don't have okay, them with okay, me. Okay. So work, did, work diligently for the beauty of working but don't strain. It's a fascinating mystery to solve. Look with light-hearted curiosity. Look for insights into your behavior. Look, feel, listen, etc. then relax. It's the most natural thing in the world. Yeah. Yeah, and that certainly wasn't the way I approached it, but that's, that's my advice for somebody else's. Yeah. Yeah, we, we get to the point where we don't take ourselves too seriously, but we still at least for me, uh, I was way too serious, you could say, about... Yes. Yeah, yeah. But that was your path, though. Yes. Yeah. Right. Whatever that means. Yeah. 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 And so my advice to somebody else is that wasn't necessary. It may be for you, you know, for a yeah. person I'm talking to, but uh, it, I can see in retrospect it's probably not helpful. Okay. Yeah. Well... We end on some advice that's not helpful. <laughs> we try and use the unconscious TV with a nice summary, something positive. But, yeah. Uh, no, that, that, that I would say is helpful, that positive yes. yeah, summary. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, Art, thanks very much for coming in. It's been a, it's been a very interesting talk and a very moving at times talk. I um, want to show Art's book, Solid Ground of Being. And we're now actually going to do um, a small separate program 
which is about meditation based on a paper that Arthur's written about meditation, which I think will be helpful. And I hope you see me again soon on Conscious TV. Thank you. Hello, uh, welcome back to Conscious TV. I've just interviewed uh, Art Tickner, and we're just going to do a separate piece of about 10, possibly 15 minutes, talking about meditation, which is something he, have, he found very hard for a long time, but now has certain pointers and certain advice, which I found very interesting. So Art, you meditated for 25 years. Yes. And it was a tough call at times, wasn't it? Yes, it was. What was hard about it? Well, the, the directions from my teacher, which I think were excellent directions because they were uh, not misleading, is uh, the, the, the answers to what we're looking for are within, and we have to go within. We can't see it from here. We have to go there. But I had no idea how to do that because I seemed to, I felt like I was stuck out here. I was always looking from wherever I looked from, but it was out here, obviously. It wasn't, didn't seem to be within. So uh, I, it, for years at a time, I would religiously meditate for an hour a morning. The morning was, I, I think, if, if a person starts with a reminder to themselves in the morning of what their feeling is, of what they really want or what's missing, that's a perfect way to start every day. I don't think I did that. But so when you say what they're feeling is, what they're feeling in their body, in their minds? Yeah, for, for uh, a lot of people I think it's a yearning, a longing, and for me that was in the chest area. I think that is for many people, but not necessarily. And, and maybe some people wouldn't identify as a feeling in the body. But it's whatever, the, whatever we yearn for that seems to... Um, a home is a word that uh, rings a bell with many people, so nostalgia. Like around Christmas time, the, the stores all make a big deal of selling us things based on a feeling of nostalgia. Or mm. I came from somewhere, so we, generally we say childhood because that's as far back as our memory takes us. But uh, where things were better, easier. Uh, Richard Rose, my primary teacher for 25 years, said nostalgia is the language of the soul. And I, I sort of knew what he was talking about. So it's almost a starting point is not to try and get where we're not. Right. The starting point is where we are. Feeling, feeling that longing, the yearning, mm. yes. Yeah, I think that basically sets the mind to work trying to solve the problem. And in many ways, it's an, the mind will do it automatically if we can somehow get out of the way. Yes. <clears throat> okay, it's very different from other meditation practices where you're trying to still the mind and yes. get away from your thoughts. But you're almost encouraging the mind to giving the mind permission mm -hmm. to do what it wants to do. Right. Yeah, and for, for some people, so there, there's no general solution to this. Some people need to find a quiet place in the mind, so they would need to do the mind stilling yoga or breathing or, uh, you know, some practice that would still the mind. But that's not going to take us anywhere, is my, my conviction. Because you talk about in your notes on meditation, which people can find on, you can find this on... Your, is it your own website, or was I referred there? I can't remember. It may be on my website. Uh, so if if uh -huh. not, it's referred Self -discovery to. Self-discovery portal. Yeah. Says, you say, meditation needs to be confrontational, yes. not restful. Yeah. It also needs to be observational. Consider what a person may say when first asked what they believe themselves to be. So t t explain what you mean by meditation being confrontational. Okay. By, by that, I basically mean uh, the mind having a question. It doesn't have to be in the form of a sentence with a question mark at the end, but something that it's looking for. And to me, looking is, is a synonym for intuiting. And, and some people would say feeling. Some people might even say listening. But, so the, the sensory analogies break down. But it's the, the mind recognizes a problem. And it's the same with every little problem. You know, we're hungry. So the, the mind picks up a feeling of hunger, and it goes to work trying to satisfy that. If something else comes along in the meantime that seems to be more important, it will switch over. And to me, basically, there's this underlying problem that 
once we become, I don't know, you know, 10 years old or something like that, we're, we're, we start becoming aware of an underlying problem that isn't solved by all the other solutions. And as we get older, so like being a teenager, a male teenager, the, the mind, uh, is big, the big problem the mind intuits I need is a car so I can have dates and things like that. And I think any of those problems are basically that's the way the mind works. And when we uh, either are fortunate enough so that a period is carved out for the mind to get back at that big problem that's underlying all the time, or we carve ourselves out a uh, period to do that, uh, preferably every day so we don't have long periods of time where we forget, the, the mind will automatically try to find what it, it, what it's looking for to solve the problem. And so when you say you also need to be observational, yeah. you're watching this whole process go on. Yes, and what, what I'd say now is notice what we see. Yes. So it's sort of like sleepwalking. We can walk through a room in our sleep and not bump into the furniture. And that's largely how we live our lives, I think. So yeah, I'd say the first thing is noticing what we're seeing. And you go on to talk about um, the algebra yeah. of self-inquiry. We realize that we're looking for the self and anything in the view is not the self. Right. It's obviously part of the observational side you're looking right. you're trying to find something that isn't self yes yeah uh, any split we use might one one split may make more sense to someone than another but seer we, we are what sees not what is seen yes so we're looking for the seer yes yeah I know that yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. so yeah. any of those splits I think would would set up the, the so this is basically what we currently observe that yeah. there, there's an object, a glass with water in it, and that automatically throws in an implied observer me. So there can't be an object of consciousness without a subject of consciousness. Yes. And what we're looking for to settle, uh, either we intuit this or we, we believe somebody tells us what we're looking for to settle the mind is to see, to observe the observer, to become what we really are. But if we're observing the observer, it's still two, isn't there? And that's what, that's what happens, isn't it? That as yeah. soon as we try to observe the observer, it seems to get behind us faster than we can look yeah. back there. I know this yeah. place very, very well. I'm, <laughs> I'm observing, and I realize there's someone looking at the observer. Yes. It's just two. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah, so that obviously doesn't solve the problem. Any advice for me there? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, again, I, my, my feeling is it, it, it's almost accidental, and what we need to do is try to become accident-prone. For, for me, that was setting up these retreats okay. where I, I would, my mind, it was the only time my mind really relaxed. It may be different for the next person, but, but yeah. trying, trying to, and also to me one of the things that I think would be the most valuable is if there's time after the meditation period where, where you know, rest. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just looking further into your notes here okay. and you talk about continue, continued persistence yeah. in the face of the seemingly insoluble final opposition will burn out or blow out the resistant circuitry that prevents individual consciousness of awareness. Mm -hmm. And that is going to happen it's like a grace of God thing, isn't it? You I, can I do, think that's as good an explanation as any, yeah. <laughs> you can well, do everything that you feel you can do, but yeah. it's something from that level either happens doesn't happen. That's what happened to you on the retreat yes. we were talking about. Yes. It blew out, didn't it? Yeah, and in my yeah. case, I would say it was more like a burn. It wasn't, it wasn't traumatic like it is yeah. with some people. So to me, it just seemed like, well, some, like an insulator burned out or something. Yeah, some, for some reason, now the circuit is open and the mind sees the truth. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's very uh, difficult to say anything that's even close to right about that because when, when you're, you know what you are, you're looking into the mind. It's like being in, like being in an oyster. We feel we're in, in, stuck in the mind. At least that's how I felt. So it's like being here. The world is an oyster. I'm stuck inside the oyster. I look here and I see something in the oyster, something here, but I'm in the oyster. Yes. But the, the truth is that for light to come into the oyster, there has to be an opening somewhere back yeah. behind us. Yeah. And so when we know what we are, we're basically back where we've always been, now we're looking, when, if, when we become conscious of the body again, we're looking into the oyster world, but 
we know, the mind knows that uh, its source is really what's looking. Yeah. In other words, the mind isn't a sentient being. The mind is like a rock. The, the body mind is not a sentient being. There, there aren't multiple sentient beings. There's only awareness. Seems to me that the way you see meditation is very different from what other people see it. They think, yeah. I'm going to relax now and I'm just going to get in touch with my breathing and slow down my thoughts. Yeah. And that has a value in itself. It does. Yeah. But it isn't necessarily taking you to who you truly are. Right. Uh, if someone had a strong intuition that that was the path they wanted to follow, I wouldn't argue with them. Yes. Ramana Maharshi said, all you need to do is sink into the heart. And he was absolutely right. But what, what keeps bringing us back to the surface when we start to, it's like there's, there's a life preserver, you know, that keeps bringing us back to the surface, whether we either try to sink or whether we try to dive into the self. And so, to me, for a person who uh, gravitates towards self-inquiry, we ask ourselves, well, what is preventing me from sinking into the heart? Mm. We, we go through the initial stages, I'm the doer, so I've got to dive, right? At, at some point, we may realize, well, doing is all, I'm, I'm observing the mind doing, and it's not me. And so we get to the point where, we, where the sinking makes more sense to the mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to read one more quietly, I'm okay. going to finish to find what we're really looking for, which can only be described as ultimate certainty yeah. about what we are. We cannot rely on any external authority, no matter how much value we place on it. We must become our own authority. Yeah. And you're just saying this now, and you also mentioned it in the talk we had earlier, mm -hmm. it's all about coming to be our own authority, and from yeah. that, there's yeah. a certainty and from that, we found the ground of being. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Good. Well, thanks for that little extra. Okay. I'm just going to show Art's book again. Solid ground of being, which is uh, it's a lovely book because there's just a you take one page at a time and it either connects or it doesn't. If it doesn't, you build another page, and it's the kind of thing you keep, I guess, by your bedside table and uh, contemplate on from time to time. So thank you for watching this extra and uh, hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.